All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll bet you didn't know that with the price of your one ticket, you got two uh, user journey uh, presentations today. Uh, so ours is uh, from Adobe. Uh, we're going to be talking today about uh, the lessons that we learned migrating uh, a monolith uh, from our legacy architecture to a Kubernetes environment uh, with Istio. Uh, I'm Edward Adesiak, uh, cloud engineer at Adobe. Uh, this is my colleague uh, Rahul Chaprathi, also a cloud engineer, and James Isles from Solio. While we, the three of us are presenting, this effort was uh, the, the product of many dozens of engineers across Adobe and Solo. Uh, but to, to set a little context about what we uh, were, were working on with this project, uh, Adobe Acrobat Sign, just to give you a little background, it's part of the Adobe Document Cloud uh, uh, offering. It's our eSign service, as you might uh, guess. And uh, on top of being an eSign service, it also is a document workflow engine. Um, and we run that both for commercial and for government in FedRAMP. Uh, so the legacy architecture that we started with um, was virtual machine based. Uh, we had sort of monolithic middleware where uh, you know everything transited that that uh, that middleware segment. Uh, our footprint was 80 clusters worldwide, and we had lots of multis here. We were multi-tiered architecture across multiple clouds, including FedRAMP, uh, multiple regions within each cloud, multiple availability zones within each region, and then uh, for capacity we sharded the clusters uh, so, um, so customers uh, had uh, multiple clusters that they could, uh, could be a part of. So uh, on a, in addition to all of that, uh, we also have failover for disaster recovery. So we can fail from east to west. So even more clusters to, uh, to handle that. So a pretty large footprint. And uh, you know, just to talk about the historical context here, you know, the, 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 the architecture, since its inception in 2006 and its acquisition by Adobe in, in 2011, up until 2018, it, it just sort of evolved, uh, but didn't make any large changes. In 2018, we went all in on microservices. So we, uh, we started our own Kubernetes clusters, uh, self-managed, and we ran Istio right out of the gate relying on it more for the, the ingress and uh, the service meshing capabilities there. Uh, but the idea there was that we would take new functionality, new features, and put that in the, the microservices while concurrently running the monolith. And then over time, we would surgically transplant uh, micro, uh, monolith functions to microservices. You know, go from 2018 to today, we had 70 microservices, and the monolith is still running. So we weren't really making a lot of uh, progress towards that uh, phasing out of the, the monolith. And as a result, problems were sort of stacking up on us. Um, developer velocity was super low because it was hard for, for, uh, for developers to test their changes in a pristine environment. So uh, as a result, you know, it kind of led to uh, almost a waterfall methodology for our deployments and uh, just uh, really slowed down both their ability to make changes and for the product to get those changes out. Uh, in addition, you know, our, our load uh, profile is such that we're busy during the day, but you know, when business hours are low or, or um, you know, our, our, when it's off business hours, our, our, uh, our utilization is low. But we can't really scale on VMs the way we would really like to, and so there were some cost inefficiency there. And uh, sort of an artifact of the, the fact that we were operating in two different environments, we actually had two different teams supporting those different architectures. So uh, we had a cloud engineering team on the microservices side and an SRE team on the, uh, the virtual machine architecture. And you know, like I sort of implied, uh, cluster spin-ups were measured in the matter of weeks. Um, so to take a stab at, at sort of controlling the, the, the chaos it was developing, uh, the proposed solution was that we would uh, 
basically containerize the monolith VMs and run them on a common platform along with our microservices. So Kubernetes is obviously playing that, that role. And for us at Adobe, saying Kubernetes actually means ethos. And ethos in Adobe terms is the, uh, the global Kubernetes platform uh, within the company itself. And so we were able to move from self-managing our clusters to uh, leveraging this uh, company-wide uh, environment. It's also multi-cloud plus on-prem. Uh, it has a multi-tenant architecture out of the gate, uh, namespaces being the boundary there. Uh, but out of the gate, out of the box, what we get is uh, you know, compliance standards are already met. Uh, but there were some wrinkles. Uh, they primarily use Cilium CNI and uh, there's a lot of customization involved in the API gateways and the ingresses. Uh, so uh, from that, you can maybe infer that there was a bit of uh, skepticism about uh, service meshes at Adobe. Uh, and so our challenge coming into this was to show that you know, we were successfully running Istio in our own environments with Kubernetes. We could bring it to the, the company-wide platform and uh, show off all the, uh, the benefits that we get out of that. Uh, you know, the compliance, ingress, and then because of the aforementioned FIPS, uh, we, or sorry, aforementioned FedRAMP, uh, we also have FIPS and, and Spiffy uh, that are part of our, our requirements. Uh, and so what we wanted to do is to take that and, and deploy Istio through GitOps and uh, be able to execute this whole migration from uh, legacy to the new environments uh, with no customer downtime. And this whole project, when we really started working on it, once all the planning was done, uh, to execute it within a year. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rahul to talk about the actual implementation and some of the research involved. Yeah, thank you, Ed. Uh, so in the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about uh, some of the uh, things which are often overlooked when we are implementing uh, service mesh offering. Uh, and uh, it's, it's because of the fact that the components are kind of, uh, in a Kubernetes cluster, there are a lot of components which are deployed, which are loosely coupled with Istio, but they are still important and should be kind of, uh, you should always think about when you're doing an implementation and research for uh, when, when uh, implementing Istio as a service mesh offering. So a simplest example would be exposing the gateways. As you know, that gateways are the interface to get ingress onto your cluster. Uh, so uh, most of the cloud uh, offering have has like uh, entry built-in entry controllers. So you just uh, 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 just annotate your service to create a uh, load balancer type service, and that in turn creates a load balancer for you in the cloud. This ex in this. Uh, uh, image, you can see that uh, there is an AWS NLB and Azure public IP created right? public load balancer. While this works fine for most of the use cases, but it comes with a risk, right? So let's say, for example, uh, somebody deletes the service uh, by, by mistake and the load balance also gets deleted and there is no uh, straightforward way to retain that, right? And you lose the traffic, uh, ingress traffic and the MTTR uh, the recovery time basically to uh, recover from these scenarios are usually very high, and that obviously uh, impacts your business. So in Ethos, we uh, have a custom uh, solution which we call dedicated web. Uh, in simpler term, it's an automation to create the load balancers outside your Kubernetes system and manage it uh, outside so that in case something happens in your Kubernetes cluster, your load balancer is still retailed, uh, retained, and the SKMS, uh, uh, the DNS record which you manage in, in service now is also uh, kind of retained and you can easily recover your service. Uh, another thing which Ed also alluded to was that we uh, work in a, a multi-tenant environment and all different tenants are uh, separated by namespace boundaries, right? And uh, for our talk, uh, let's focus on two personas which are there in the cluster. One is the ST admin, and then the other are the ST users. If you look at the blue box, uh, it's a Istio gateway namespace, which is managed by Istio admin. This namespace hosts the gateway controllers and the gateway objects as well. As well. And on the right-hand side, if you see this pink box, is depicts the application namespace, which are uh, which uh, like the service team own these namespaces, and they deploy the data plane components onto these namespaces like Istio Virtual Services, 
uh, and other data plane components like destination rule and other, other things. And in the middle, there is a dependent service, uh, dependent uh, operator, which is external DNS. And I don't know if, uh, if you've heard about it. External DNS is a good tool to uh, uh, sync your domain records to different uh, uh, domain providers. Like for our use case, we were using Route 53 for our hosted zone. And uh, for each of the virtual services that we create, our DNS record would automatically sync to the Route 53. Uh, but the problem uh, uh, with this implementation was that external DNS doesn't support heterogeneous uh, deployment mode where your virtual service and the gateway is hosted in different namespace. And uh, because of this challenge, uh, we, had, we lost a lot of time. And in the end, we had to fork the external DNS to support uh, multi-shared informers, which can support, in turn, support um, heterogeneous deployment mode where your virtual service and the gateway is deployed to the separate namespaces. Uh, another example of a, of a problem that we encountered with the heterogeneous deployment mode was that uh, we were using, for some of the use cases, we were using a cert manager to, del uh, to create self-signed certificates. And uh, that self-signed certificates need to be tied up to the STA gateway because our traffic was being terminated at the gateway. Uh, and again, as uh, you might be familiar, that the cross-referencing of the na uh, of resources in Kubernetes is generally uh, not supported by default. And for Istio, Gateway doesn't support cross-referencing of the secrets if you want to terminate the, your traffic to the gateway. So again, this solution didn't work out for us. We tried multiple things. In the end, we decided to open up the gateway namespace uh, and uh, create some automation users so that the service team can deploy the gateway and the certificate uh, uh, within the same namespace itself. That said, I'll pass it on to James to talk about the other stuff. Yeah, so as Mike Tyson famously said, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Uh, I've worked with probably about a dozen companies in the last three years, uh, including as an SRE, putting Istio into production or running Istio in production. I would say rarely is the problem with Istio, but there's almost always something attached to it that you need to understand that causes an issue that you have to fix. Uh, Adobe was very, very good about having a great deal of staging and planning, so these things didn't really catch them out too badly. Um, but it is something to keep in mind with every actual real-world transition to Service Mesh. Uh, one was um, HTTP 1.0 support. Uh, if you're like me and you think that you've rem memorized every HTTP code, 426, I had to look that up. It's right next to 418, which is Teapot, because I hadn't seen it in so long that I don't remember what it was like to have HTTP 1.0 call, call me out. Um, Again, when you're integrating this, there are always legacy systems that someone has worked on. Maybe they work there. Maybe they don't work there anymore. Maybe it's forgotten, sold, that no one even remembers what it does. Uh, one of the nice things about Istio is it's not that new anymore. I mean, we're talking about 2019. That's now five years ago, which feels terrible. But things like HTTP 1.0 support is a solved issue. It is just changing a flag in Istio to, to fix it now. Um, you know, the, 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 there's a lot of robust fix that have, that have gone on as time has gone on. So these things are no longer too much of a problem. Uh, but this was one thing that did, did need to be fixed. Um, I would say of the problems I see amongst customers often is using a legacy system that someone has forgotten or, or needs to be fi uh, figured out. Uh, one of the new ones, though, uh, was Cilium. Um, I imagine there's a great deal of people here running Cilium. It's a wonderful CNI. Uh, one of the things that happens when you run uh, Istio for FedRAMP compliance or you have security requirements is you run the Istio CNI uh, as opposed to elevated privileges for your pods and sidecars, right? And that runs as a companion CNI. Istio is not the only thing that does this. Kubevert has some other attachments. There's other, other companion CNIs. And Cilium launched a patch that said CNI exclusive equals true. And it was buried in their patch notes somewhere. But that caught, I think, at least Adobe and I know some of my other customers got caught out by this because it stopped working uh, they're, 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 the Istio CNI stopped working altogether. Um, again, not an Istio problem, but it is something that, that can happen. You do have to understand that the total ecosystem around it. Uh, something to just keep in mind. The other one, and, and this was a new one for me, I think everyone here has probably touched HA proxy, and your general understanding is, oh, well, I have a bunch of routes in, and it would distribute a bunch of routes out. What I didn't understand, and Adobe didn't understand either, and I think most people don't understand, is it's random. It's not round robin specifically, it's not based off latency. And so if you have a lot of these, a lot of HA proxies, and you have a lot of uh, AWS NLBs, and Adobe is a very large company, this is a very large, ethos is very, very large, you can end up with a scenario where 
you've basically pulled the bad card too many times and you end up running everything kind of into one Istio ingress gateway. Um, because there's a hot spot, and that's what happens when you do random. Someone's going to get unlucky. And it is, you know, it's a testament to, to understanding, ha having to understand all of your ecosystem and, uh, the, and how Istio fits in with it. And culturally, to understand where the boundaries of what Istio can and can't do. Uh, you you kind of have to figure this out. Um, and this was pretty easy to fix, changing the way the AJ proxy is configured, but it was a little bit surprising. Yeah, so uh, when you're, uh, this, these couple of slides may, may or may not directly apply to you, but this will give you a general understanding, especially for people who are starting uh, their uh, service mesh journey or maybe starting to implement STO in a production grid environment. These slides, previous and the coming ones, would at least give you an idea like what all things you could probably potentially look at and not just focus on the control plane and the data plane components as well. So uh, one, th one such thing was uh, uh, SMTP gateway with IP preservation. So this was, so we had a legacy system which were running post-fix servers on virtual machines. And uh, uh, one of the thing was, one of the requirement was that because, uh, uh, because of the legacy systems, they were, uh, we had some, some implementation or some routing logic where we do routing uh, based on the downstream IP, the client IP which we get and then we uh, allow or disallow the fur further processing of the emails. Uh, when we try to get this SMTP service onto uh, the Kubernetes cluster as part of the migration, uh, as you can see in the table, we tried multiple things uh, using TP proxy, proxy protocol, and other things, uh, and all, none of the combinations helped us achieve uh, getting the, preserving the client IP to throughout uh, to, to, to the application container which was Postfix, and we ended up keeping that um, uh, SMTP service in the VM itself. So this kind of gives you an idea that not all, probably not all services are well suited for, um, uh, for porting to, to a Kubernetes environment and the mesh itself. Uh, this is another example of a legacy system, uh, how it, uh, it used to work. So if you see on the left-hand side and if you observe, the key of this header is a camel case, right? The tag T is capital. And as you, as you guys uh, probably know that the service-to-service -service service communication conforms to the HTTP 2.0 standard, which, which uh, dictates that all the headers should be, uh, should be lowercase, uh, the key uh, and the value as well. So by default, what was happening is that when the client was sending um, uh, a camel case key in the header, uh, the gateway uh, was uh, sanitizing this and making it lowercase and then sending it back to the application. And that was being re returned to the uh, downstream, um, uh, downstream services as well. And those being legacy systems, and, and you can imagine that uh, these application, these downstream services were from banks and from other legacy-based, uh, which tend to have more legacy-based systems. They were just blocking it, and, and uh, teams started getting a lot of 503s. Uh, so um, uh, in the end, the solution was applied at the client itself, but this was something which, uh, which we realized later. So these are the kind of things which you should uh, keep in mind when you're implementing a service mesh solution like Istio. Uh, with that, I'll pass it on to James to talk about observability. Uh, this is one of my favorite stalking horses. So uh, we've talked a little bit about you know, why they're going to Istio, Fed, FedRAM compliance, moving into Ethos, you know, the, the, the security, getting MTLS everywhere, and I think we've had a couple talks here about, oh, well, I need to add the control, connecting to Spire, everything else. Do not sleep on the observability you get from Istio. It's probably the most powerful thing you're going to get. Confluent was right. You get this to your security team, they're happy, which means you get a little bit easier access to the rest of your projects. Keeping your security team happy is always a good idea. Uh, I will say that in my own experience, when I first put Istio in production, uh, the observability actually let us re really realize that we didn't need a change in the way we control and time, we do timeouts and retries and timeouts. What we needed to do was let our application teams know the way their services were performing, and that solved most of our problems. I, I mean, I, I really cannot stress this enough. Um, I will say that one thing that Adobe did that I think they did a phenomenal job on, um, and I want to call it specifically, is they had very, very good dashboards for Gateway, which they handed off to their SRE team, which means you kind of a, have a split interest that your SRE team's going to be able to really understand what the traffic like is going in and out. And they did something that I think more people should probably think about, which is they have very, very good observability coming from Istio D itself. Tracking XDS push times, 
how long, uh, how many resource, uh, what the resource uh, usage looks for, like for Istio D. Um, whether it's low or high is not relevant. What is relevant is if something is going wrong, you have historic data later. It also helps you understand, you know, how your uh, your information is scaling up, how your infrastructure is scaling up, what happens when you add more services. I, I, I do want to call it Adobe did a really, really fantastic job with this. All right, great. Well, I think that that brings us to you know where we are now, and ultimately where we're going to be going to next. Um, so actually, just a couple of weeks ago, we shifted traffic over to our final cluster, uh, and we were able to do that without downtime. So uh, we have no more of the, the legacy middleware out there. Um, and uh, we were able to deploy Istio uh, completely via GitOps, which was uh, you know, a huge benefit to, to us. Uh, but among the other benefits that we had, um, you know, as I talked about before with our scaling, now we can really be really aggressive with uh, our scale in and scale out. And uh, so uh, we're able to, to realize the cost uh, gains there. Uh, the, the risk around our deployments and the, uh, the time that it takes for us to do them has uh, dramatically reduced. Um, also, uh, the support for these clusters has now been consolidated under one SRE team. So uh, a lot of lowered support overhead. And I can just say, too, that you know, once you get Istio up and running, uh, it tends to just keep running. And a lot of the, uh, the issues that we're called in on nowadays, I think it's more about proving that Istio isn't the problem. And uh, it's usually the case. Uh, the other thing is that developer velocity has improved quite a bit, going back to that whole deployment risk thing. Every test, every change that uh, the uh, developer uh, submits is, is, has a pristine environment to test against, an ephemeral environment to test against. So where we're going, uh, like I said before, there was a bit of skepticism about service mesh at Adobe. Um, so we're really hoping that we can be kind of a test case and, and uh, be good advocates for uh, other use cases where we, we see it uh, you know, make sense within the, the Adobe environments. Uh, and then another thing, too, is that, you know, we want to uh, fine-tune a lot of the automation. Uh, GitOps can be finicky sometimes, and so I think there, there's more opportunity there for us to, to realize gains around that and make it truly like a one-button push operation. But uh, James, I think, can go ahead and talk then about uh, Ambient. Yeah, here's where normally I'd beat the Ambient drum, but been People have talked about it. Uh, obviously, things like upgrades without restarting deployments, as Mitch had mentioned, like those are all phenomenal things. I'll just put it this way. If you're on the fence about putting Istio into your infrastructure because of perceived complexity with sidecars or just perceived perplexity with Istio itself, or you have Istio in production now, or you're on this, the fence about, do I really want to go to Ambient? It's time to get off the fence. It's GA. The more people adopt it, the better it will be. It is a very, very large step up for, for Istio and for the way that networking works in Kubernetes and potentially outside of Kubernetes. To me, Ambient and the gateway changes that have happened in Kubernetes are akin to what Kubernetes did to the old way we deployed Docker. I mean, the, the networking stack of, of the way most infrastructure is run didn't go through a massive revolution like containerization and Kubernetes did. And it, I, in my opinion, and I think a lot of shared opinion amongst people within the Istio community, that's kind of happening now. So time to get off the fence. I think uh, with that, that concludes our, our talk. So uh, I think we've got a couple of minutes for any questions. If not, I thank you all. We'll be around afterwards if, uh, if you all have anything to, to talk to us about. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, everyone. <laughs>